not just this night Linger for so long Why do they bind Hands that did no wrong Why do they hurt Insults at a king Where is the land Oh, this suffering Good morning, Hope Church Second Service. That's that. Good morning, Hope Church Second Service. All right. That guy's trying to keep up with first service now. They're really enthusiastic about being here. For those of you that uh, are new, our church, uh, during the winter months, we have uh, the homeless people come here and spend on Friday nights and Saturday nights. And a lot of the members of this church cook dinners for them and stuff like that and then clean up in the mornings and stuff like that. It's really a good program. It's through Shore. And I don't know what SHORE actually stands for. But anyways, they sent us a nice little uh, 
appreciation, note of appreciation for all the work that we do as a church. And I tell you, I'm proud to be affiliated with a church that does take care of the people in society that need their help. So for those of you that participated, I'd like to give you a applause, please. <laughs> now, as some of you know, our pudgy, passionate Portuguese pastor is in Portugal today. So wave to him, say, hey, Stan, all right. Of course, probably four in the morning there, or nine at night. Anyways, so it's Ladies' Day at the church. We get Gina is going to preach to us today. And having sat through at the first service, <laughs> it is awesome. That's all I say. And your family there, you guys are going to be blushing and crying and stuff. Do you got any Kleenex in this third row back? Okay, they're going to need it. They're going to need it, believe me. Normally when you come to church here, you see Barbara Crisp, the greeter. She's our, our short greeter out there. She's been doing this for years. Anyway, she's in the hospital this morning with pneumonia. So if you would keep her in your prayers, you know, she's having a pretty rough go of it right now. So, And <coughs> after the service, if you came in the back, we already know. But if you didn't, uh, Juan is, and his lovely wife have decided to help the youth group because they've been helping them all along. And they're making uh, Mexican dinners and stuff like that. And it's eight bucks for a good, really a large good dinner. So please stop there. And, it, and all the money goes to support the youth group, which is really a good group of people. So, you know, we came here, <coughs> gosh, when, when Stan first showed up, we had like 30 people in the church. And now we have 70 people in the youth group. I mean, it's just awesome. They do a great job. <laughs> In this economy, <coughs> I doubt that anybody's looking for work, but if you know anybody that is looking for work, by the way, uh, we're, we're affiliated with several other churches that put on a workshop that, uh, for employment interviews, resumes, and stuff like that, and all the information's out there on that table, but the date is June 13th. Uh, I've participated in this for a while, and it is phenomenal, the amount of information you get, and they'll help you write a resume, they'll help you go through oral interviews, so if you have anybody, you know anybody, you don't have to go to our church or any of our churches. If you know somebody that's looking for work that would benefit from this, please feel free to sign up for it. It's free, and it's, uh, they, they really put on a heck of a program for people looking for work. It's a good thing. If you have kids, kitties, uh, not cats, little kids, there's a, a play group workshop here on Thursday, and it's for babies and toddlers and stuff like that. So I guess they teach the kids plays and stuff? I don't know. Anyway, that's Thursday at 10 a.m. So bring your kitties and your kids and stuff and bring them to church. There's also a lot of other information on that table out there. We have a hike. We have a hiking ministry at this church, and there's a hike coming up. We have archery and archery ministry, and there's archery lessons and stuff coming up. So there's just so much going on. Just stop at that table out there, read your bulletin. Get involved. Be, be a participant. There's just so much to do here. And I tell you, if you didn't, if the music gets off a little bit, Elizabeth, 13-year-old Elizabeth today, is in charge of the soundboard. They gave her the whole deal, so she's doing. So if any of it doesn't work right, go see Elizabeth. <laughs> Anyways, there's people here I know are here for the very first time, and some of you that don't know other people. So take a moment and say hello to somebody.
my life It's led me down the road So uncertain Now I'm left alone And I am broken Trying to find my way Trying to find the faith that's gone This time You know the answers I'm tired of losing hope And taking chances On a road I've never seen To be the one that brings me home Give me a revelation Show me what to do
Every single one of us is a masterpiece of the creator, made in his image to bring him glory long before he put each of us here, right where we are. He had a plan, a plan to save us from our own selves, to free us from the entrapment of sin. And Jesus is that plan, sent from God and killed on a cross. Jesus became the sacrifice that would allow us to be forgiven. And as we take communion this morning, let's remember that sacrifice that gives us hope, the body and the blood of Jesus that sets us free. Let's remember our Redeemer, our Savior, and our King. Day. I lift up my life 
Hi, Hope Church. As you can see, I've recovered from my jet lag. I'm hard at work studying the Word and preparing for future lessons and sermons and looking for missionary opportunity while I'm here in Portugal. I asked for uh, Gina to speak for me today because as we continue our series on why we hope, Gina is a life of hope. She's a picture of hope. She's been very inquisitive and a seeker of God since a little girl. And in her life, in her journey, uh, she too has been through some challenging times, but she did not let them stop her from seeking God and now serving as our um, office administrator and ministry connections. She's already helped us be a better church, and um, she's got a, a great message about hope that you're going to be blessed by today. So give it up for my friend and my co-worker, Gina Darby. Thank you. 
Thank you. Are we off now? We're off. All right. <laughs> Let's hit the beach! Bonsai, Gina! Good morning, Hope Church. Morning. You gotta love Stan's sense of humor, huh? He's awesome. Well, thank you, all of you, for coming to our worship celebration, and thanks to those of you watching us online. Um, a couple of months ago, Stan had asked me if I would give a message while he was in Portugal. And I was like, what, me? And he's like, yeah, <laughs> you're serious, I'm serious. Okay, so I prayed about it and um, God put it on my heart, so I accepted. And I'm excited to be here today. Um, I wanna share with you my story, but before I share my story with you, I would like to share um, some parables from Luke that had meaning to me um, when I finally found my way back. So we're going to read in Luke 15. Um, you can look in your Bibles or it's up on the PowerPoint. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So I'm going to stop right, just right there for a second because I love how Jesus is always somewhere. People are gathering around him like they're, they're they're attracted to him, and then you have the, the critics, you know, they always have something to say, like, that man, and I, he's just such a boat rocker, and I love those little parts. I'm glad they didn't, um, that they included them. So, then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And this is such a wonderful depiction of how God feels about his children. A celebration in heaven. A heavenly celebration. Can you imagine what a heavenly celebration must look like? Over one sinner. Have you ever looked for something that you misplaced and rejoiced when you found it? Does it make the joy greater the longer it's been gone? If it's gone too long, do you forget about it? Maybe with us, but not with God. He never forgets. And hallelujah to that, because some of us wander a lot longer than others. So to continue, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to the field to feed his pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This is one of my favorites because it gives a clear example of how even those of us who stray away can come to their senses and be forgiven and celebrated for our return. I really like the part where he says he came to his senses. Clearly, he wasn't hurting when he demanded his estate or when he left. And he, he wasn't really making very good choices. But one day, there it is. He finally came to his senses. And I think that that is true with um, some of us. Does it matter how long we pursue the world and are turned away from God? Does it matter how we sinned while we were away? How about how good we were before we strayed? The truth is that we are all sinners saved by grace. And no matter how long it took, if you were only lost before you were found, or if you fell away and came back to be found, ask and you will be forgiven. And this brings me to my story. Um, I've never shared my story to a group, so please bear with me as I try to sum up 13 years of wandering. Um, I'm the oldest of three. Uh, my parents divorced when I was four. I was raised by my mom in the Paradise area. Um, I attended and graduated Paradise High School. I went to Butte College and Chico State, and then finally, just recently, graduated with a bachelor's from Grand Canyon Christian University online. Um, I was raised in church. I loved church. I accepted Christ at eight years old. Um, I belonged to my youth group. I developed a love for music at a very young age. Um, and I sang solos in church, and I volunteered at all the functions, and I was kind of a staple around there. Um, my family was really involved in church. My uncle was a youth pastor. My Grammy and granddad were both leaders in our church. My mom was on the worship team. My aunt sang and led junior chapel in the church where she lived. Um, I was blessed all the way around. Very well taken care of. Never went without. Um, there were struggles, but I didn't know about them, you know. Um, my mom always taught me to be an individual and to love Jesus. And I was on the right track. I was going there. Um, at about 15 years old, I found myself facing decisions that I'd been taught would come, and I'd learned how to handle them. But I didn't respond the way I'd planned. Have you ever prepared yourself for something, practicing what you're going to say, how you're going to respond? You study the various outcomes, you know the right choice, but then when the time actually comes, you blew it? Well, this was like that, but way worse. Instead of repenting, because I knew the truth and straightening up my act, I justified my choices with anything I could. I'm just having fun, you know, I'm being a kid. I'm not doing anything too bad. You've got to enjoy life while you can, right? Well, I'm young enough to do it. You know, I, um, I've been a problem solver in math <laughs> and, and life for most of my life. So finding excuses to justify my actions was easy. And it only got easier the more I did it. So um, I'm not going to be able to touch on every component that put me in the place where God rescued me. But I'll tell you about the big ones because we have 20 minutes and not days. <laughs> so I continued making poor choices, knowing it was wrong, doing it anyway. I blamed the reactions from my friends at youth group and the whispers on judgmental Christians. Um, once again, one of those things that you, you, know, you learn to justify your behavior to not feel guilty. Um, at 16 years old, my boyfriend was killed in a car accident. Um, that was my first experience with real depression. And I was angry, and I was brokenhearted, and I rebelled. And I quickly replaced him with another boyfriend and more bad decision making. Um, my grades dropped. I was cutting classes. 
I started experimenting with alcohol and cigarettes. I quit attending church. Uh, I was headed down the wrong path and I knew it, which was bad enough for myself. But as the oldest, I was a horrible example. And I exposed my siblings to things that I should have been protecting them from. And that was a fact that would haunt me for years. So I decided after high school graduation that I would join the Army, and I did. I was seeking purpose, and I was looking for a future. And I did not have security in, in where I was and what I was doing, so I was going to make it for myself. So I went, and on September 11th, 2001, I was on an airplane when the National Ground Stop was issued. Um, I wasn't scared. I was convinced that I'd made the right choice. I knew that this was what I was supposed to do. Despite the circumstances, I wasn't worried about it. So I went and I completed boot camp with an injury. And I was established at a training site afterwards. You do boot camp and then they send you somewhere else to get trained. And it's just, you know, long hoopla, a bunch of stuff. Um, and once we got established, they sent us home for leave. It was around Christmas time. Um, and when I came home, I went right back to it. Same choices, same group of people. It was not good. Now, fortunately, I only had two weeks of leave. So how much damage can you do, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, I did enough damage in two weeks to regret forever. Um, when I finally, so they send me back, and, and I'm back at my training site. And the Army decided that because of my injury, and it not healing properly that I was going to be worthless to them. And this was a huge problem because I had found my purpose and I had set my future in that plan. And now it wasn't going to be anymore. So who was I? And this was my second real experience with depression. And it was bad. I had lost everything I thought that I belonged to. I gave up on myself. I searched for an answer from God, and I didn't get one, probably because I wasn't listening. But So eventually, they sent me home. And just like on my leave, I went right back to the same stuff, same friends, same bad decisions, except this time, I stepped it up a notch. I figured, what did I got to lose, right? Well, I found myself in situations that I still, to this day, cannot believe that I was a part of. I lied. I experimented with drugs. I drank all the time. I had too many non-committed relationships. I was the life of the party. Except I had a giant hole growing inside of me that I didn't know how to fill, and nothing I was finding was working. So eventually, thinking I could fulfill this with love, I committed myself to a relationship with a man who had no job, no car, he smoked pot, he lied, he had no real aspirations in life, but he did have a drinking problem. I made this relationship my whole life. It was my whole world. I made excuses for his behavior. That's how I justified it. I ultimately tried to change his life by sacrificing my own. And it, I became somebody I didn't even know. Um, I knew that this was not the way to live, and I knew what I should have been doing. And I would often, in my guilt, seek Christian mentors um, that I had in my life, and I would cry, and I would repent, and I would tell them everything I'd been doing and how I felt and where I knew I needed to be. But it didn't matter. I still drug my feet. I was often reminded of the error in my lifestyle by the emptiness that I felt. I couldn't fill that hole. So I continued to sing in the bars, knowing in my heart I should be singing for the Lord. I continued to live with my boyfriend, knowing that I shouldn't be. And I just flat out lived a life that I knew was bad. And I just kept doing it. And when the weight of all the bad choices got too much, and I couldn't handle being lied to and cheated on, and pushed around, I left that emotionally abusive five-year relationship. I didn't stop doing anything else. I just moved out. That was going to fix it. 
I was sure of it. So seeking a new future, this relationship had ended. I'd made a good choice by leaving, not changing anything else. I met, I met someone else, which was no big surprise to anybody who knew me because I always had a boyfriend. And that was what I revolved my whole world around, was that relationship. But this time, I knew it was different. He was a Christian man, a little older than myself, about seven years. We were looking for the same things. We had the same kind of baggage. Now, everybody has baggage, but we together had enough baggage to fill a U-Haul. And we were going to do it. So we fell in love, and we very quickly married. And we started attending a church. And we went to premarital counseling. And we would attend on Sundays. And it seemed like everything was fine. You know, except we weren't changing anything. We were partying all weekend and going to church on Sunday. Not really sure why nothing wasn't working out. And my relationship with God was like a ritual. It was like, here's this thing I do because I know that God is the God of the universe. And I don't want to go to hell. So I kept doing it. But I always knew that Jesus was Lord. I knew who was in control. I just didn't want to stop doing what I was doing. It was fun, right? Like, why is the, would the world be tempting if it wasn't an enjoyment? And it was. I had a great time. But like I said, that hole just kept stayed empty. No relationship. Nothing was working. And it, was, um, it didn't last very long. We moved to Paradise from Chico. And we quit attending our church in Chico, and we didn't find another one. But we didn't stop going to the bars. And he worked in a bar, and I sang in the bar, and that's what we did all the time. Um, the relationship was anything but godly, but I did give it my all. And after a year and a half, he left me for another woman. Um, as you can hear through most of this story, I, I very closely relate myself to what's going on in my life. And so this was like oh, a horrendous blow to me. I was the most third and deepest experience with depression I had, I've ever had. I was absolutely crushed. At this point, I had a little drinking problem. I, um, I didn't have to drink, but when I did drink, I didn't stop, and I turned into a person I didn't know. And nobody who knew me knew who it was either. It was ugly. Um, I was convicted. Conviction was my constant companion. I lived with it every day. I was guilty. I was broken. I hated myself for things that I had done, for the people that I'd hurt, for the loved ones that I impacted negatively. God was pulling at my heart with such an intensity that I almost couldn't bear it. Nothing was right. I felt like an absolute failure. I, um, I, I had no hope. I desired for my life to be different, but I couldn't expect that it would happen. My sins had consumed me. I just fell into it. I had no self-respect. I was a drunk. I was suffocating in vanity. I was mean and hurtful to people. I was hopeless. And then through various circumstances, um, I ended up sitting right back there in the back row with my family as we came to um, accept prayer and give thanks for a gift that Hope Church had presented to my cousin, who was severely wounded in Afghanistan. Um, this was one of those, you're all coming to church, right? So we did, <laughs> and we sat in the very back row. And I remember sitting there and being like, who is this guy talking about his own sin? Like, you know, I wasn't used to pastors that even wanted to mention their own shortcomings, let alone like actual sin, things that we knew we should not be doing. And I thought I had to have it all together to be a pastor. And um, I was intrigued. So I kept coming back. Guilty, convicted, broken, hurt. I sat back there and I cried through every single service for months. I mean, I needed my own box of tissues when I walked in. <laughs> and I'd just leave them on the seat for me. I couldn't sing. 
I listened through the sobs. It was, it was something to see, I'm sure. But uh, it was growth. I wanted so bad to be loved. My mom always loved me. And I am very blessed to know well the love of a mother. But the love of a father was something that I experienced in a kind of on and off sense. And I'd had male mentors, and I'd had a, a great stepfather who loved me, and, and I went through it in my life, but I never really understood it. And I would see my friends with their dads, and I would be like, that is so weird. Like, what? I don't get it. It didn't make any sense to me how a man could, could love a child in the same way that my mom loved me. So it just, I never got it. And um, I needed it. And I didn't know what it looked like. And I didn't know how to have it. And I, um, I needed purpose. The world had taught me that to be loved, I had to be beautiful and funny. I had to have it all together. I had to wear the right clothes, play the right part. But despite all of my efforts, I never could really fit in that mold. And so I felt inadequate all the time. And I was paranoid. Are they talking about me? Is my, is my outfit funny? Do I look fat in this? What are they going to say if I do this? What are they going to say? It was, it was out of control. So just tore up. I totally felt. Like, I didn't belong anywhere. And I needed to feel that I mattered. And I needed to know that I had a purpose. And to know that I was here for a reason. That I was loved and I had security. And that is what I found in Jesus. I found hope. I began to study that book that I knew all about. Because I knew all the Bible stories and I knew all the kids' songs and I knew what Jesus did. And I had it in my heart, right? But I found things in there that I'd never seen before. Though I had read them before, it was different. I found hope for a purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I was like, I have a purpose. <laughs> There is a reason I am here. God has a job for me. I am not here to succeed in the world. I'm here for God. And the same is true for all of us. I found hope for a future. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. A future. Security in a future. The thing that I'd been looking for over and over and over again, God already had for me the whole time. It, it was a phenomenon. Now, let me tell you something about this verse. My mom has said this verse to me my whole life. It's in every Bible I owned. She's recited it to us. If, if any of us can remember a verse, it's Jeremiah 29, 11. We might not know what it says, but we know how to say Jeremiah 29, 11. But when I read it this time... It was like brand new. It was like I'd never read it before. I'm like, hope and a future? Plans. I like plans. So this was all about it. I felt like I was learning a new language. I also found hope for love. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is the ultimate love. This was not the love I found from my boyfriend. This was not the love I was looking for in a father. This was not the love that my mom gave me or the love that I had with my sisters or the love that I had with my best friends. This was a love that surpassed all those loves. It's the only love that matters. It's the only one that can love you more than anything else. Nobody else can love you that way. And it was a really hard lesson for me because there's a big difference between physically feeling somebody hug you and feeling the love from God. And it was, it was a challenge. But I got to tell you what, I have never felt loved more. And it's the only love I need. 
because it's the only one that fills me. It fills me. And I also found hope for forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness? I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I can be clean? Like, I can forget about all of that stuff I did to myself and all of the things I put myself through, and I can just be a, a brand new Gina? Like, like, I was never, ever dirty. It was amazing. And, you know, it's the truth. It's the truth. And uh, now I had hope. I desired for my life to be different, and I expected it to be. And I threw myself into God's love with more passion than I had ever given anything. And I knew that this time, it was all or nothing. And I would no longer waste the breath, the voice, or the time that God gave me searching for acceptance or success in a world that had flat out betrayed me. I'm not here to be successful in the world. I would use every breath and every song and every second to bring him glory because nothing matters more than him and nothing is right without him. It wasn't until I finally realized that I was here to love God and love his people that I was finally able to love myself and to really love somebody else. I was finally able to give the man who loved me when I couldn't and forgave me of some horrific things my whole heart. And now he calls me wife. And he shows me mercy. And he teaches me what grace is all about. And he is that relationship that I looked for in the world so long, but only got through God. And you know, as God changed my heart, he started changing hearts around me. And my family, some of whom I never thought would ever go to church again, go. And they found Jesus. And some of my friends who mocked me for being the Bible thumper, even though I was nowhere close to being that, you know. <laughs> but because I believed in Jesus, that made me something different than they were. And they have found Jesus. I got my best friend back. Uh, Megan and I were inseparable friends as little girls. Um, we didn't do anything without the other one. And um, we both wandered away from God about the same time. Ironically, we did not know each other in those lives. We walked away from God, and we kind of walked away from each other. And the tragic event happened in her life, and I just felt this need to call her, and I didn't even have her number. And I tracked it down from people, and I called her, and we picked up right back like we had never missed a beat. And she came to my baptism here, and she never left. And now I don't only get to worship with her, I get to serve with her, and I get to watch her children be raised with the heart of God. Amen. Children, I wasn't even around when they were born. Reconciliation happens too. It's a beautiful thing. My walk is very far from perfect, and I fall short all the time. But I get back up, and I keep on keeping on. You know, I lost a lot of friends when I gave my life to God, a lot. But I found hope in hope in you, Hope Church, a family bound not by our own blood, but by the blood of Jesus. I never in my whole life ever could have ever imagined that God would not only free me from my shame, but that he would make all of my dreams come true. I get to serve him as a job. <laughs> Use my greatest passion to lead people in worship and to build relationships that will last for eternity. You know, if you have turned away from God or if you're looking to fill that emptiness in your heart, I really encourage you to seek him. There is nothing greater and he'll take you back or he will take you in always. 
and heaven will rejoice. Put your hope in Jesus, and you will never be the same. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your mercy and your love. I thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus, for our forgiveness. I ask that you lift up the hurting and fill them with the joy and peace that only you can give. You alone, Father, are the reason and purpose for life. And we thank you and we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Father, thank you for this family that celebrates giving. We give because we love and because it's not ours anyway, it's yours. 
And we pray that you bless this offering and use it to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So before we give, what is our purpose? Building relationships that last forever. And how do we do that? Love God, love people. Yay! So remember, until next week, in Christ, amen. Thanks for coming. That was me. Refire. It's weird. you got to hit the right notes with this thing. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Go ahead. you got to tune it sometimes. Too. Yeah.